Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to start discussing the binding theory. At the beginning, it is necessary to hold some terminology that are necessary to explain the binding theory. We have some expressions that we will get through our discussions. We have a binder, bindy, binding. Then we have something called index, co-indexed or corfer, antecedent, then we have our expression, anaphore, pronoun, three, locality, binding principles A, binding principle B, and binding principle C. Okay, these are the uh, whole expressions that we have to start. We will start now at the beginning with these three expressions. They are expression, anaphore, and pronoun. Actually, the semantic types for NP, we will see uh, what is the meaning of binding um, and in which uh, parts of speech it happens. So at the beginning, we have to look at the semantic types of the NPs or the noun phrases. We have to look at three types. We have the R expression. Okay. Now, the R expressions, of course, we have and a four, and the third one is a pronoun. Our expression means the NP that gets its meaning by referring to an entity in the world. So simply, if I say, for example, Joan sends an email to Felix, for example, paper. Okay, let's look at the whole NPs that we have here in this sentence. John is an NP, email is an NP, Felix is an NP, and paper is an NP. All of them refer to something or refer to someone or refer to an entity in the world. So John is a man, email is something that we use to uh, communicate, Felix is a name for a paper, and the paper is an entity in the world. All of them are referred to as R expressions. Of course, this will uh, be applied on all names in the world, whether we're talking about the names of people or whether we're talking about the names of things. Okay. The other type of uh, the NP is called anaphore. Let's see, two. Anaphore. Okay. Anaphore is an NP that obligatory gets its meaning from another NP in the sentence. Here we are talking about, actually, the reflexive pronouns. Reflexive pronouns. Okay, like, for instance, myself, all pronouns that have a self word by the end, like myself, himself, itself, herself, etc., and the word each other each other. Now, if you find any of these reflexive pronouns in a sentence, okay, it means it has a reference. So they refer back to someone or to somebody uh, or to uh, something. Let's have um, an example. Let's say, for example, Joan, okay, prepares, himself for the class. Okay. Let's see. So if I ask the question, himself is a reflexive pronoun. It refers back, it gets its meaning, it's obligatory, it gets its meaning from a previous noun, a previous NP. So, simply, we can say that himself refers back to John. So, the word or the reflexive pronoun, himself, gets its meaning from a previous noun in the same sentence, which is John. These are the anaphores. Now, the third uh, type of the NPs, as it is mentioned in the binding theory, is the pronoun. And here, actually, we're talking about the subject pronouns, and the object pronouns. Okay, 
Now, uh, for the pronouns, it is an NP that optionally, it is not obligatory, optionally gets its meaning from another NP in the sentence or from something else in the context. Actually, we will get this in details later on when we go through the uh, binding principles. Now, for the pronoun, it's not necessary to get its meaning from the same sentence as we have in the uh, reflexive pronoun. It can get its meaning from another word in the same text or in the context. Let's have a look or uh, on this um, uh, uh, example. For example, if I say uh, she, okay, she prepares the, for example, the details. And this is the end of the sentence. If I ask you about the reference of this pronoun, okay, now this sentence starts from here and ends here. It means that we have no other, uh, let's say, uh, NPs that we can refer this pronoun, she, to it. So this means that she, I mean this pronoun, refers back or gets its meaning from another uh, word in the context. Suppose that we have uh, a complement here up this sentence. Um, it is a text. So we can get the meaning of this pronoun from some somewhere else. But it's not necessary from here. Whereas if we have an object pronoun, let's say, for example, um, he gives him a paper. If I ask the question about this pronoun, can I say that this pronoun refers back to this word or to this NP? The answer is no, because here it's not necessary for this one to refer back to this, this pronoun in the same sentence. It may refer back to uh, another NP in the context. Suppose that he, I mean by John, and him is, uh, for instance, um, let's say, uh, Jane. Okay? So it is not necessary for this pronoun to go back to the same NP or to an NP in the same sentence. So this is the meaning of optionally. So in the pronouns, it is an NP that optionally gets its meaning from another NP in the same sentence or from another sentence in the context. Okay. Now uh, we will go. We will go back to these terminologies. So at the beginning, we've got the uh, the three types of the uh, NPs. So we have the R expression, the anaphores, and the pronouns. And actually, we will go back to a lot of details later on about everything of uh, every type of them. Now let's go ahead to see what is the meaning of uh, index. Okay, index, antecedent, and co-indexed. Okay. Okay. Now, antecedent simply, antecedent, antecedent is an NP that gives its meaning to another NP. So we are going to say something like a reference. So if I ask you about this sentence, Joan, Okay, prepares the same sentence that we've got before some seconds, himself for the class. And if I ask you this question, that is, this reflexive pronoun refers back to whom? Okay, you will say that it refers back to John. So John, this NP, gives its meaning to himself. So John and himself are the same. Okay, since Joan is the reference for this, for this pronoun or for this reflexive pronoun, so we're going to call Joan as antecedent. Okay, so antecedents, let's say in most cases, antecedents are the R expressions. Since they are what? Since they have the entity or the meaning of the entities. So suppose that we have uh, another example like, uh, for instance, uh, John 
John gives uh, him um, a paper. Okay. Uh, John gives himself a paper. هلا John gives uh, him. It's not necessary for this pronoun to get its meaning from the same sentence as I've told you before. Let's see this sentence. For example, if I say John is a student. Full stop. Then I say he gets high marks. Okay. Let's go ahead to see he. Now, for this sentence, he gets high marks. I have no NP that uh, works as an antecedent. Okay, so if I have this sentence as alone, he gets high marks, I can say that he refers to someone, but I don't know who is he. Since I have a text here, starts by John and ends here, with this full stop with the marks. So I can say that he refers back to an entity uh, here in the context. So from the context, from the meaning that I've got from this text, I can guess that this pronoun refers back to John. Okay, so since uh, John gives the meaning to he, to this pronoun, so I can say that John is the antecedent for this pronoun. Okay. So this is the meaning of uh, antecedent. Okay, now if I have two NPs that refer back, refers to the same entity, I will give them a mark. This mark will be called index. Okay, we will see how. Suppose that we have the same, the same um, uh, let's say index. We have the same uh, example. So for instance, Joan prepares himself for the class. Okay. Now, this is an NP. This is an NP and this is an NP. Now, based on what we have uh, discussed before, we can say that himself refers back to John. Okay. So, John and himself refers back refers to the same entity so i will put them inside a bracket and i will give them a mark this mark will be uh, like a little uh, letter for instance i like this and here i will give it the same one okay now this mark is called index it means if i give these two NPs, the same index, it means that they refer back to each other. Okay, now what about the word class? Class refers back to himself? No. It refers back to John? No. So I will give the class, okay, I'll write it here. I will give this NP another index because it is almost different from the previous ones. So I will give it another index, something like, for instance, J. Okay. So, this index means that John and himself, since they have the same index, this one, so they are the same entity. Whereas the word class, this NP, has no reference and it refers to nothing, so I will give it another, uh, another index. Okay, now since John and himself refer to the same entity, I will call them as co-indexed co-indexed or there is another uh, expression used in binding theory which is corfer corfer it means that these two NPs are co-indexed they are they refer to the same entity in the world okay so let's go back to the expressions that we have so we've got what is the meaning of index and co-indexed and antecedent. Fine. So suppose that we have uh, this sentence. For instance, we have, um, yes, Joan gives Anna a book. Okay. Now we have three NPs here. We have John is in an, in an NP. Anna is an NP and book is an NP. Okay, let's give them indexes. So, John, for, for instance, has uh, the index of I. 
okay? Does Anna refers back to John? No. So I will give it another index. So I'll give it something like J. And for book, I'll give it something like, okay. So these indexes means that none of these NPs refer back to each other. I'll give you another example just to see what we have. For instance, uh, Joan, okay, Joan gives himself a break. Okay, now logically or based on the grammar that we have uh, learned in English, we can say that this NP gives the meaning, so it is a reference to this reflexive pronoun. In other words, we can say this reflexive pronoun himself refers back to John. So I have to give them the same index. But suppose that I give them different index. So I say that the, uh, John has an I index and himself has a J index. So I will uh, refer to this sentence as with, with this instick just to say that this sentence is ungrammatical. Ungrammatical. Why it is ungrammatical? Based on the binding theory, okay, uh, these NPs must refer to the same entity. So this reflexive pronoun or this anaphor goes back to this R expression, so they have to have the same index. In other words, they have to be co-indexed. But since they are not so co-indexed, so this sentence is um, considered as ungrammatical. How to make this sentence grammatical? So simply, I will make this index the same as the index of John, which is I, for instance. In this case, uh, these two NPs refer back to the same entity, so they are uh, co-indexed, and so they are. Uh, this sentence is grammatical, okay? So it is perfect. Now, let's go ahead to see some other examples, like... For instance, Jones' brother, okay, teaches uh, himself the steps. Okay. Now, suppose that I've got Jones' brother. This is an NP and himself is an NP. Suppose that John's brother, uh, his name is, for instance, uh, James. Okay, so here I have to put in my mind that I am talking about a man whose name is Jim. And here, this James or this one must be the uh, reference for himself. So if I give, I'll give you two examples um, with, with the same uh, sentence. So. I have here, Jones, the same sentence, brother teaches himself the steps. Okay, now I'll give them um, indexes. So suppose that I have got I here and an index here, which is so similar. I can say that this sentence is grammatical since John's brother is the reference or is the antecedent for this anaphor. So since it is the antecedent of this anaphor and logically and semantically, they refer back to each other. So this sentence is grammatical. But suppose that we have here something else. Suppose I have John as I, okay, and let's see, John's brother, I'll give it something else, like, for, for instance, J, okay, what I have to give the himself, what I have to give this uh, anaphor, shall I give it the, um, uh, the index of the whole NP, which is J, or I, the index of only John? If I give it the uh, index of only John, Okay, this sentence will be considered as ungrammatical. Okay, so this sentence, based on the binding theory, is not grammatical. Why? Because 
I refer this anaphor only to John, as if John, um, semantically, um, he, he teaches the, the steps by himself or something like that. Whereas if I want to make this sentence as a grammatical sentence based on binding theory, so I have to think in the way that the index for this anaphor must be similar to the index of the all NP that is here, which is John's brother. I'm talking about a man whose name is Jane, for example, and uh, his relation to John is that he is brother of John. So simply, I will say that since this NP, John's brother, has the index of J, so I'll give himself, this anaphor, the same index to make this sentence a grammatical one. So by the end, I can say that in this way, uh, this sentence is a grammatical. Now we are going to see the principles, the binding principles A, B, and C. And by going through the details, we will get what is the meaning of a free, what is the meaning of locality, and what is the meaning of binder, bindy, and binding. Binding principle A, this is the first principle regarding the uh, binding theory. First, it says that an anaphor must be bound in its binding domain. We have to focus more on this principle to see that it has to do with the anaphors. And as I've told you before, anaphor means the reflexive pronouns like myself, itself, herself, and so on. And here we have to see what is the meaning of bound and what is the meaning of binding domain. First, bound means simply we can say that bound means linked. Bound in binding theory means there must be exist two conditions. The first one is co-indexation. What is the meaning of co-indexation here? It has to do with the anaphor and the antecedents. Uh, the antecedents of uh, the anaphor must have the same index, so they must be co-indexed. And the second condition is C command. We will have um, an example and we will explain each condition in details. So suppose that we have this one. For instance, John, the same example, three pairs, himself, for the class. Okay. Well, simply, I can say that John is an NP. It is the, uh, it is an R expression, or it is the antecedent for what? For himself. Himself is an NP. It is an anaphor. Um, it refers back to John. So simply, I can say that John is the antecedent of the anaphor himself. Okay, we have to see if this anaphor is bound with um, uh, its antecedent in its binding domain. So the first, first we says here that bound means co-indexation or the two conditions that we have to do to have the co-indexation and the C command. We will see what is the meaning of. So let's go ahead with the tree, with the syntactic tree. So simply I can say that TP for this sentence, I will get um, NP and VP. So this NP is John and this VP is verb and NP. The verb is prepares and the NP is himself. In this stage, I just care about the NPs. Okay, suppose that I have this index, so it has to do with I, for instance, or J or K, whatever you want, but you have to put the same index. So uh, let's check if the antecedent or the anaphor is bound with its antecedent in this uh, sentence to explain if it is grammatical or ungrammatical. Okay, so the first condition says that the anaphor must be bound uh, with its antecedent, so there must be co-indexation. If I check the index here, it has the same uh, index. So the first condition is uh, ticked, so it is uh, exist. So for this sentence, uh, both the uh, anaphor and the uh, antecedent are co-indexed. Okay, let's check the second one. The second uh, condition says that the antecedent, 
okay, the uh, antecedent must C command the anaphore. In other words, we can say the binder or the antecedent must C command the bind D, which is the anaphore. Okay, the uh, C command here will be asymmetric C command since it has to do with the uh, between the aunt and the nieces. If I check, okay, this NP C commands this NP. But the reverse C command must not be exist in this way. What is the meaning of that? It means that the C command must not be between the sisters. Okay, so uh, because of that, because uh, the two conditions are existed, I mean the co-indexation and the C command between the antecedent or the binder and the anaphore or the bind D. Okay, so the binder or the antecedent C command the bind D or the anaphore and both the antecedent and the anaphore are co-indexed so that, based on binding principle A, we can say that this sentence is grammatical. Okay, let's check the ungrammaticality of another sentence. Suppose that we have this sentence, for, ins for instance, herself. I will start my sentence with herself. Herself teaches. Okay. Anna the steps okay this sentence is considered as ungrammatical and i will get this mark to say that it is ungrammatical i will explain now why it is ungrammatical okay based on binding principle a it says that the anaphore must be bound in its binding domain okay so i have to check even these, um, let's say, two NPs are co-indexed. Let's say that it has the same index, okay? Even they have the same index. Even they are co-indexed, but again, they are not grammatical, or the sentence is ungrammatical. We will see why. Okay, let's check the syntactic tree. It has to do with NP and VP. Then we have verb and NP. Okay, based on this sentence, this NP is co-indexed with this NP. So where is the problem? Let's explain the meaning of C command here, or the condition of C command. Okay, this NP, this NP must C command this NP, or in other words, the antecedent must C command the anaphore, but not reverse. Okay, if I check this sentence, where is the antecedent? It is Anna. So it has to do with here. This is the antecedent, or this is the reference for this anaphore, which is herself. If I need to apply the C command condition, so I will make it as a reverse C command. And this is so wrong. This is not applicable in binding theory. So because of that, because of the C command condition is not existed, okay, so this sentence is ungrammatical. To be grammatical, I have to make the C command as being uh, from the antecedent, or in other words, the antecedent must C command the anaphore or the binder must C command the anaphore. So to make this sentence grammatical, so simply I have to make the antecedent here, which is Anna, okay, and the bind D or the anaphore must be existed here, herself. Of course, with the same index. Okay, now if I check the grammaticality now of this sentence, so both the antecedent and the anaphore are co-indexed since they have the same index. And if I check the C command condition, so I can say that the sentence is grammatical. Why? Because the antecedent or the binder, C commands the bind D or the anaphore. 
In this case, I can say that the sentence is grammatical. Okay, we will check now what is the meaning of binding domain. Let's see this sentence. For example, I have uh, the sentence of Anna said that herself is not ready. Okay, this sentence is considered as ungrammatical. Let's check what is the problem for this sentence. Suppose that both the uh, antecedent and the anaphore are co-indexed. Okay, they have the same index. Based on binding principle A, there must be three conditions. Co-indexation, then the C command, the C command of what? Uh, the uh, binder must C command the bind D, but not reverse. Now, what is the meaning of binder? It is the antecedent. What is the meaning of bind D? In this case, it is the herself. Uh, okay, the third condition is the binding domain. In other words, binding domain means locality. In other words, it means the location. Let's see what is the meaning of location. Binding domain, it means that the antecedent will be the reference or it will give the meaning for the reflexive pronoun or for the anaphore if they exist in the same clause. But if they are in two different clauses, even if they are in the same sentence, but the condition will not be existed. Okay, so when I check uh, the co-indexation between the um, uh, binder and the bindee or bi between the antecedent, Anna, and the reflexive pronoun or the Anna for herself, so both have the same index, they are co-indexed. So the first condition is existed. Uh, let's check the C command. Anna said that blah, blah. Okay, we will see. So I have TP and P and VP. Then I have verb and CP. Okay, let's see the sentence again. Fine. And then, so simply here we have Anna, and here we have said, and here we have see that and here I have to have another TP starting by NP and something else so I have uh, herself I just care about these two NPs in this sentence okay so uh, based on the C command based on the syntactic tree this NP is co-indexed with this NP both are co-indexed and for the C command, yes, the binder or the antecedent C command the bind D or the anaphore. So the C command condition is existed. So where is the problem? Okay, so co-indexation is existed. C command is existed. Let's check now the locality or the location of both of them. Now, if I uh, check the, the syntactic tree here, I can see that the first NP or the um, antecedent is existed in a TP and or in a clause and the other NP which is the uh, reflexive pronoun or the anaphore herself existed in another TP. So this means that Anna is in a clause and herself is in another clause. So this means that the binding domain is not existed. Now to make this sentence grammatical <clears throat> so both must be in the same clause. So instead of having a 
reflexive pronoun here, I can have a pronoun since the locality is not a, is not a condition. So uh, I can say, for example, Anna said that she uh, prepares herself for something or prepares for or teaches herself for something. Okay. So uh, the binding domain is the uh, condition is not existed. Because of that, I can consider this sentence uh, as ungrammatical. Okay. So it means that the anaphore must find its antecedent in the same clause. This is the meaning of locality or this is the meaning of binding domain. So uh, for this uh, anaphore to refer back to its antecedent, this antecedent must be in the same clause. Otherwise, the binding domain condition will not be existed. So as a summary, we can say that for binding principle A, it has to do with the anaphores. Okay, so the three conditions that must be existed between the antecedent and the anaphore are three. So first we have to do with the co-indexation. Okay. The co-indexation must be between the antecedent, antecedent and the anaphore. They have to have the same index. The antecedent has another name here, which is binder. And the anaphore has the name of bindy. Okay, the second condition must be C command. Simply, it has to do with the following. The binder must C command the bind D, but not reverse. But this is so important, not reverse. And this will explain the ungrammaticality of many sentences. And the third condition is with the binding domain or the locality. The binding domain. It has to do with uh, the idea that the anaphore must find its antecedent in the same clause. This is so important in the same clause, not in the same sentence. So uh, by the existence of these three conditions, we can say that the sentence is grammatical. Now we will move to the uh, next principle, which is uh, binding principle B. In binding principle B, it has to do with the, with the pronouns, which is the second semantic type for the MP and binding theory. And it says that a pronoun must be free in its binding domain. We have to explain now what is the meaning of free and what is the meaning of binding domain. Binding domain is already explained in the first uh, principle regarding the anaphores. Now, free is the opposite of bound. Free is the opposite of bound. Once we say bound, bound means co-indexed and uh, C-commanded. Uh, it means the antecedent and the anaphore. Whereas the free, it must not be co-indexed and it must, it must not be commanded with the antecedent where in its binding domain. Now we will check some examples to explain this uh, principle. Suppose that we have Anna teaches her uh, the steps. Okay, now we have to check this pronoun with this um, our expression. Okay, suppose that these uh, two NPs have the same uh, co-indexation. So um, it has uh, the same uh, index. So this means that her refers back to Anna. Can I say that the sentence is grammatical? The answer is no. This sentence actually is not grammatical because based on the binding principle A, the, uh, the pronoun 
must be free. It must not be bound in its binding domain. If I check this sentence, I will consider this sentence as having only one clause. So in this one clause or in this one binding domain, the pronoun must be free. And the reference or the antecedent for this pronoun must be outside this sentence or outside this clause. It must be um, understood from the context. Let's check how. So if I want to make the sentence as grammatical, so simply I will change the, um, the index. Okay, so this uh, pronoun has the index of I and I can say that this has the index of J. For, for instance, in this case, the sentence will be a grammatical. Why? Because the pronoun here is free. It is not bound with its um, uh, uh, antecedent in the same binding domain. Okay, so uh, suppose that I have another uh, example like this one to check. Okay, suppose that I have Anna says that she will leave. Okay, now I will make just um, a space for will. Suppose that I have to check whether this antecedent, Anna, um, is bound with this uh, pronoun. Okay, suppose that I get this index with them. Can I say that this sentence is grammatical or ungrammatical? I will check. Actually, the sentence is grammatical. Even this pronoun has two indexes. Okay, so these two indexes means that she refers back to Anna. Or it refers back to uh, some other girls outside the sentence uh, understood from the context. I can say that this sentence has two correct choice. So the pronoun is a free in the first one. Uh, if I check or if I consider this one, okay, it means that the, um, the pronoun is a free in its binding domain when Anna and she have different indexes. Okay, so Anna is with the index of I and she is with the index of J. So both have different indexes and she is in a binding domain that is different from the close or the binding domain of Anna. So this is a TP and this is another TP. Because of that, she or the pronoun is a free. It is not bound with anything in its binding domain in this close. And this is correct. Okay, shall I consider the uh, second uh, uh, index, which is I? Okay, I can say the pronoun can be bound when it, with its antecedent when they have limitation on where they can't be bound. So she, or yeah, she is bound with an NP and another clause. And this is acceptable. That is to say, she refers back to Anna where it is located in another clause. So because of that, I have the same index for them. So I with I. So the condition is still existed. That is to say, uh, the pronoun she is a free in its binding domain. So um, it has to do with, uh, it, it doesn't have any antecedent in the same clause. So in both cases, we can say that the sentence is grammatical. So in the, both in the first case, where Anna is indexed with I and she is indexed with J, it means that she refers back to, for instance, Sarah, who has existed in another place in the context or in the text. Whereas in the second case, when she, the pronoun, has the same index with Anna, it means that she refers back to Anna which is located in another clause. And this is actually uh, acceptable. So the idea of binding principle uh, B is that for the pronoun to be free in its uh, clause, let's say, or in its sentence, or in its binding domain. Okay, now the third uh, principle, it has to do with the R expression, binding 
principle C. It has to do with the R expression. Simply, it says that R expression must be free. Must be free. Everywhere. It doesn't have to do conditioned with the binding domain or something like that. So, simply, I can say, for instance, Anna teaches Sarah the steps. Simply, I can say that Anna has the index of I and Sarah has the index of J, for example, because Anna refers back to a girl and Sarah refers back to another girl. But to make this sentence as ungrammatical, so I will make them with the same index. Okay, this R expression, this sentence is, of course, not grammatical because uh, I make Anna and Sarah as being the same girl, and this is not acceptable, actually. So for the R expression, let's say Anna, it must be free. It doesn't have to do, refer back to anything but to this girl. And Sarah must be free. It must not be co-indexed uh, or uh, bound with anything, um, whether we are talking about the same binding domain or different binding domain. Okay, let's go ahead now just to check the, again, the terminology that we've started the video with. So we've uh, checked now what is the meaning of binder. So binder means the antecedent uh, or the R expression that gives the meaning for the uh, anaphores or for the pronouns. Bind means the anaphore. Uh, it has to do with the, or the pronoun sometimes. And binding means uh, that they are connected with each other. I mean, the binder and the bindy, it means that they are connected with each other by the existence of some conditions like the C command and the co-indexation. Then we've checked what is the meaning of uh, free. Free means the opposite of bound. It has to do with the idea that this pronoun uh, has no reference or no antecedent in the same uh, binding domain. Locality means the location or the binding domain. Um, it has to do with the clause. So uh, one clause is different from another clause. One sentence is different from another sentence. And the binding principles A. Binding principle A has to do with the anaphores. Binding principle B has to do with the pronouns. And binding principle C has to do with the R expressions. So these are the whole terminology that uh, are explained in the binding theory. That is the end of uh, discussion uh, for the binding theory. Thank you for your listening.